All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're so excited for tonight's events. I'm just kind of looking at the comments to see where people are joining from. Uh, some Greensboro, North Carolina folks, Williamsburg, Virginia, Kent, Ohio, Vancouver, San Diego, Kalamazoo. Wonderful. We've got a very, very great uh, co collection of people from all over the world. Um, we'll get started here in just a, a minute. Um, but please keep sharing where you are joining from in the comments feature. Um, we, we like to keep track and know where people are from. Chicago, very good. Hamilton, New York. Concord, Massachusetts. Wonderful. Very good. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eric Bontempo, and I am one of the co-directors of Jane Austen and Company in the Jane Austen Summer Program. I'm joined tonight by my fellow co-hosts, David Palco and Deborah Barnum. Our technical director for this series is Nadea Pugh. We are all tied by a love of Jane Austen, British literary and material history, uh, and in this series, the Bronte sisters. Uh, tonight is the start of our spring series, Austen and the Brontes, which aspires to increase public awareness and marginalized histories related to Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, 19th century England, and women's literary traditions in general. So we are so excited for tonight's performance of You Are Passionate Jane, a play written by Diana Birchall and performed with Siri James. On Tuesday, April 2nd at 7 p.m., we'll have our next event featuring Leslie Peterson, who will lead us in a creative writing workshop where we'll learn how to write a good rave or a rant like Jane Austen and Emily Bronte. Please visit our website for the details to get more information and for the entire slate of speakers for this series. We have a total of five events planned for March, April, and May, and we hope you'll join us for all of them. If you happen to miss one, however, you can always watch them on our website at janeaustenandco.org. And my fellow co-host David will now talk a little bit about the series as a whole. Thank you, Deb. So we just wanted to first acknowledge at the outset that this program in this series was made possible by North Carolina Humanities, which is a statewide nonprofit and the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities that connects North Carolinians with cultural experiences that spur dialogue, deepen human connections, and inspire community. So we are very grateful for their support for this series. Um, and along those lines of the, the mission of North Carolina Humanities, this is just a little bit of the underlying rationale for the series. Um, our approach is seeking to explore commonalities while embracing difference. Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters, each among the most enduring women writers of the 19th century, are regularly compared to one another. In our society obsessed with rankings and competition, people are fascinated by debate over who is the best author among the group. Perhaps egged on by Charlotte Bronte's own mocking of Jane Austen and her craft, saying, the passions are perfectly unknown to her. Our lecture series instead seeks to deepen participants' thinking regarding these women. Rather than focusing on who is best, our lectures will consider common threads that united these authors, explore features that indeed differentiated each, and most importantly, ponder how the experiences of these women writing over 200 years ago relates to our contemporary human experience. In so doing, our speakers will draw from several fields and lenses, including mu museum curation, feminism, history, close reading, juvenilia studies, and adaptation studies, among others. And on a broader level, we hope our program will implicitly challenge that need to define a best, the tendency of competition to break down community. By upending the long-standing debate about the relative merits of Austin and the Brontes, we hope our audience will leave the program more able to appreciate what makes someone different without a need to define that quality as better or worse. We hope the audience will see that there is more that unites us than divides us, and that differences only add to the richness of our community. All right. We, we hope that you all are now fully energized and excited about what lies ahead. 
And now it's time to get started. We are joined tonight by two fabulous individuals who know Austin and the Brontes very well. Diana Birchall worked for many years as a story analyst for Warner Brothers Studios, evaluating novels. Reading popular manuscripts went side by side with a lifetime of Jane Austen scholarship and resulted in her writing Austen-esque fiction, both as an homage and close study of Jane Austen's style. She is the author of Mrs. Darcy's Dilemma, In Defense of Mrs. Elton, Mrs. Elton in America, The Bride of Northanger, and hundreds of short stories. She and Siri James have co-written several Austin-esque comedy plays, which have been performed in many cities. Diana's own You Are Passionate Jane, a dialogue between Jane Austen and Charlotte Bronte in Heaven, has been performed by many uh, has been performed for many appreciative Jasna audiences, as well as at the Chotton House Library in England. So Siri James is the international best-selling author of 13 critically acclaimed novels of historical and contemporary fiction, including The Lost Memoirs of Jane Austen and The Secret Diaries of Charlotte Bronte. A life member of WGA, JASNA, and the Historical, no, Historical Novel Society, Siri has sold 20 screenplays to film and television and written, directed, and performed in original plays across North America. Um, and she's spoken at numerous JASNA events and at Charlton House in England. Her books have been translated into 21 languages and won many awards, including the auto book Audie. She is currently writing a new series of historical mystery romances set in 19th century England, and that will be published in 2025. All right. And before Diana and Siri begin their performance, which should last about 45 minutes, our technical director, Nadea, will explain how you can send in questions during and after the performance. Thank you so much, David. Hi, everybody. Welcome to YouTube, our streaming platform. If you'd like to leave a comment or ask a question, please use the comment feature on the sidebar. We'll collect your comments throughout the performance, and then during the Q&A after the performance, Diana and Siri can answer those questions for you. Um, so please comment and get your questions in. We love to hear from you. You will need to log into your YouTube or Google account to post in the comment feature on the sidebar. But if you don't have a Google or YouTube account, that's OK as well. You can just submit your questions to info at janeaustinandco.org, and we'll collect questions there as well and ask those for you. Yes, we're very much excited for the Q&A that will follow this performance. Um, and so now, without further ado, we are excited to present You Are Passionate, Jane. Why are you crying? Wouldn't you cry if you had to leave your husband and your poor sick old father who is blind? Never even saw your babe. If I were of a certain sort of sensibility, I might. Of course you would. What kind of a woman are you who would not cry to leave all that you loved behind? I have left those I loved behind. Consider, I am older than you and have been here longer, but I did not leave only those whom I loved. Who, who are you? Where is this? I know I was very ill with the babe. Am I in heaven? Does this look like heaven? Perhaps to some, to be alone with me, and to have a conversation might be a kind of heaven, but not, I think, to you. I am Jane Austen. Jane Austen? Yes, and you are correct in your surmise. I am indeed in heaven, but you are not. You are only in the middle sphere as yet. What? Not in heaven? But I am a Christian. I am a rector's daughter. So is I, for that matter but your father's profession will not be of any weight in your application for entry. Do I, do you mean to say that I must apply? Certainly. And to, to you? Why, yes. 
the powers that be have very mercifully approved of the novels that I wrote while I lived on earth. I waited long for a publication there, but my ascent here was rapid. I don't understand. Why, you see, one must have a share of the sacred labor, and everyone has his proper job. It was considered that I might be engaged in a kind of employment that I would think heavenly. And doling out people's fates is your idea of heaven? My dear, it is the very definition of heaven. But remember, in my writing, my subject was always men and women. It is no different here. Suppose not, if you regard it in that way. I always had a sharp judgment, you will not deny, and loved to make the justice appointments in the hereafter for my characters. Now you see this talent is being much better employed. I am indeed a judge. Not that it is a sad job. In many ways, it is one of the most diverting ever created. For what do we live but to laugh at our friends and to be laughed at in our turn? <laughs> laugh? You can laugh at people suffering and pain. Oh, you are cruel. I always knew you had no heart. Yes, I know very well what you have written about me. You wrote, the passions are perfectly unknown to her. That will be taken into account, Miss Bronte. To give you the name that will be known throughout eternity, I am aware you are really a Mrs. Nichols. Do you mean to say that because I did not approve of your writing, I am to be consigned to, to a terrible fate? Oh, no, no, no. You have already had your terrible fate, poor woman. I know what your sorrows have been. No, you may depend upon me to act justly, rationally. I have the advantage, after all, of living in the age of reason, which you unfortunately did not. We shall merely have a conversazione, a little communion of spirits. And then I will go back to my usual employments. I have many more divine books to write, which only the people here are privileged to read, of course. I see. You think pretty well of yourself, don't you? Charlotte, Charlotte, is that resentment you are breathing? Resentment is a sin. I will make a note. A resentful nature, that is a severe fault indeed. Yet even resentment is not your prevailing sin, I believe. <laughs> what do you think that is? Pray tell, Miss Austen. Ah, no, no. That, I fear, is not the proper way to address me. I'm sorry that you do not pay more attention to forms, Miss Bronte. Do not you remember? I had my Mr. Bennet say, Do you consider the forms of introduction and the stress that is laid on them as nonsense? I, for one, do not. <laughs> no, I am not Miss Austen. For my darling sister has been here for, let me see, if you are dead, it must be 1855. Yes, quite 10 years now. She rose to join me at once as she was so very good. And we have been united ever since knowing true happiness together. Your sister. I wish I could see mine. That is a warm and noble sentiment. Be assured I do give you full credit for a loving heart. I am glad you are able to perceive that much. I did not think you would. Do you really think I am unable to love? Is that what you think of me? You seem to know what I wrote about you as well as I do. Oh, yes. <laughs> I recollect that you wrote to Mr. Lewes and corresponding with that gentleman hardly counts in your favor as a virtuous act, as you must be aware, Miss Bronte. I will repeat it for you in case you have forgotten it yourself. Us too. It is right. We should remember that which pains us. Well, it is about pride and prejudice. You wrote, and what did I find? An accurate, daguerreotyped portrait of a commonplace face a carefully fenced, highly cultivated garden with neat borders and delicate flowers, but 
no glance of a bright, vivid physiognomy, no open country, no fresh air, no blue hill, no bonny beck. I should hardly like to live with her, ladies and gentlemen, in their elegant but confined houses. Yes, yes, that is what I wrote. How, how do you come to know it so well? I wrote it some years after you were dead. How? In heaven, we have many privileges, including that of reading all correspondence written in the world at any time and remembering every word. There is only one word in your letter which I do not understand. And that is? What is a daguerreotype? <laughs> what curious. Oh, no, sorry. Um, oh, it is a more accurate, scientific sort of painting, an actual image taken with the reflection of shadow and sunlight. I believe I have a daguerreotype right here. I wear this locket with a, a picture of my father on one side and my husband on the other. It is my dear sister's locks woven about it. You may see it. Hmm. But this is most ornate. What curious taste. I can see it is the influence of that very bad style which will come to be called Victorian after that queen with whom I expect to be acquainted eventually. She will be consigned here in another half century. Yes, I, I suppose she will. She is very good. And so these are daguerreotypes, very curious. I like paintings better. They are light, bright, and sparkling. These are rather flat. So you think my characters in Pride and Prejudice are commonplace, do you? Elizabeth, commonplace. Mr. Darcy, Mr. Collins, Lady Catherine. I confess I am rather surprised. I do think they are commonplace. I think they are vulgar. You and Madame de Stahl. Well, I had my judgment on her, my first upon a fellow author. <laughs> she died only four days after I did, you may recall. Really? Yours must be an interesting privilege indeed. And are you never tempted to abuse your power? I hope not. That would be a worldly sin, and I am above all that sort of thing now. And so, you are the final judge on all literary people? Why you? Why not Shakespeare or Milton or Pope? They have had their turns as Judge Laureate. <laughs> I believe it was thought right to give a woman a chance. Ah, did you also decide on Walter Scott then? He would be admitted to heaven, I'm sure. Lord Byron? <laughs> I can guess what you did about him. Miss Bronte, I must tell you that you are not here to discuss other people's stories, only your own and mine, as it affects your situation. Of course. So, you think I did not write about the outdoors sufficiently? romantic scenery, crags and crevasses. It is very true I did not allow Lizzie to go to the lakes. But did you not read about Anne Elliot in Persuasion going to the sublime beachy cliffs of Lyme? I have not read Persuasion. Oh, I see. No wonder then that, well, I think you would have found sufficient passion in my writing had you read Persuasion. I have only read Pride and Prejudice and Emma. Yes, I know. You do go on about Emma. You wrote, I read it with interest and with just the degree of admiration which Miss Austen herself would have thought sensible and suitable. Anything like warmth or enthusiasm, anything energetic, poignant or heartfelt is utterly out of place in commending these works. All such demonstrations, the authoress would have met with a well-bred sneer, <laughs> would have calmly scorned as outré and extravagant. Yes, and I stand by those words. <laughs> if lacking in enthusiasm for the works of Jane Austen prohibits me from heaven, then I do not want any part of it. Surely love of you is not a prerequisite. Heaven cannot be composed of your uncritical admirers alone. Yet, in only a few short years after your demise, 
my admirers, as you call them, will be known as the Jainites. <laughs> yes, in heaven we'll have its very own chapter of the Jane Austen Society. Jasna, heaven, and what meetings they will have. <laughs> will they, indeed? Then I hope I never have any band of mad adherents that will call themselves Charlottians or Bronteans. <laughs> Not quite the same degree, Charlotte. Now, may I proceed? It is your moral sense I must assess, you know, and as dear self always plays a part in these judgments, it will be best for me to try to understand yourself through your criticism of me. My criticism of you has almost nothing to do with my life and how I lived it. On the contrary, it has everything to do with it. See what you write. She does her business of delineating the surface of the lives of a genteel English people curiously well. There is a Chinese fidelity, a miniature delicacy in the painting. She ruffles her reader by nothing vehement, disturbs him by nothing profound. Ah, here's where you say that about the passions being perfectly unknown to her. Now remember that word, passion. How you do go on. You wrote, she rejects even a speaking acquaintance with that stormy sisterhood, even to the feelings she vouchsafes no more than an occasional graceful but distant recognition. Too frequent converse with them would ruffle the smooth elegance of her progress. <sighs> what a bitter joke it is that my fate should de depend upon literary criticism of all things. Yes, one of your errors in life is that you never quite realize that the Almighty has a sense of humor. Everything with you is a joke, Jane. Jane. I am sorry I gave my best and most deeply felt heroine your name. Was she named after me indeed? I will take that into account, even if it was unconsciously done. No, I did not have you in mind at all. Not one whit. You haven't even read that book, have you? Any of them? I have read Jane Eyre, of course. And Villette, they show your personal faults all too plainly. You are not helping your cause, you know, by these little fits of pride and temper. But perhaps it is not fair to consider your failing to appreciate me. You are really not capable of it. No one who has no sense of humor could. I am afraid I do not find my situation at present very funny. No, you would not. Well, let us skip over this part where you say, I am no poetess. I can only agree with that. I have no pretensions as to poetry. But you write, Miss Austen being, as you say, without sentiment, without poetry, may be is sensible, more real than true, but she cannot be great. I have been pleasantly surprised to find that eternity has judged otherwise. Perhaps. Let me ask you, Charlotte, if I may call you that? How could you bring yourself to write to such a man as Mr. Lewes? Were not you aware of his living with his mistress? George Eliot is a very great writer. Surely even you cannot deny that. She has not come before me yet, nor has Mr. Lewes for that matter. They are both still living in sin. Oh yes, I know of their illegal and immoral attachment, of course. All the world knows that. It has been shouted to the heavens. But I did not know it, Miss Jane. My correspondence with Mr. Lewes began in 1848, after he wrote a very kind review of Jane Eyre. He only began to misbehave with George Eliot, as Miss Evans is called, last year. And I was shocked. Yes, I was. But the man was a Darwinist. Years before meeting Miss Evans, he shared his wife with another man. <laughs> she had natural children by him. Surely I need not detail all his sins to you. You know them. They were common knowledge to the world. How then could you bring yourself to write to such a man? Where were your, what was your propriety, your 
decent reticences? Had the morals of London polluted your mind entirely? Mr. Lewes wrote an essay about the realistic novel. He said I had invented it. Oh, I understand. You were flattered then. That explains a great deal. So you have a portion of vanity. That is another venial sin. I suppose it is. Had you no vanity then, yourself? Oh, yes. My vanity was in such very good order that I was never suspected of having any. But I have made expiation for that sin. How does not concern you, but it does have something to do with the office I am at present occupying. That is all you need to know. I will only say that it is not possible to judge people's lives without learning something of compassion. Yes, I should think that is what you need. You are hard, Jane, hard. I, why, I must be nearer heaven than I thought. I see I am able to read your letters too. They pass before my eyes. How strange. How magical. It is not magic, I assure you. That would be infernal. It is only that time is infinite and angels are everywhere. Well, whatever it is, I see a letter of yours where you wrote that a woman must have died of a fright having seen her husband unawares. Yes, yes. That is one of the things I had to do penance for. I should say so. I could never even think far less right. Such a cruel, callous, spiteful, unkind thing myself. Merely to be thought a wit. And look, here is another. Stop. Let us put an end to this literary backbiting. I will concede that you have written something very truthful and just about me indeed here. You are comparing me to another authoress mercifully forgotten, Eliza Lynn Linton. You say, with infinitely more relish, I can sympathize with Miss Austen's clear common sense and subtle shrewdness. If you find no inspiration in Miss Austen's page, neither do you find mere worthy, windy wordiness. She exquisitely adapts her means to her end. Both are very subdued, a little contracted, but never absurd. Yes, I stand by those words, too. They are true. Well, then. It, it is time, then, for us to discuss the passions. The passions? I cannot discuss such a subject with you. Anything but that. I'd rather leave this place. You see, there is nowhere for you to go, and I have all eternity to wait. We all must face up to ourselves in the end. That is easy for you to say. No, Charlotte, it was not easy. I had feelings too, passions even, though you deny them. I was angry sometimes, very angry, but I was not only angry, I cared about my friends and family and therefore controlled myself. If you had known true passion, you could not say such things. You talk like a child. How can you possibly understand anything of what I have felt? You, who never loved. I did love and was disappointed. When a person is disappointed in one way, you know he can generally find happiness in another. Impossible. It is true. I grant you that I was happy in my temper. A propensity to find enjoyment and entertainment everywhere is the choicest blessing of heaven. That is a fine sentiment. A great truth. Where did you find that? I wrote it in persuasion. A pity you did not do me the favor of reading it in your lifetime. You make me wish I had. But Jane, 
even though our tempers were different, and you were more placid and peaceable than I. Placid? Well, well, a calmer nature, let us say. Even so, we both truly found solace and happiness in our writing. Speaking for myself, it was when I was writing that I was most truly absorbed. That is fair to say. But what you wrote was often so very illuminating. Let me read from Jane Eyre. Do you know how many times you use the word passion in that book? Who knows? Who cares? It could not be spoken often enough. A very great many. Beginning here, in the scene where the servants have to actually hold little Jane Eyre down. Hold her arms, Miss Abbott! She's like a mad cat, one cries. Her aunt looks on her as a compound of virulent passions, mean spirit, and dangerous duplicity. She says, you are passionate, Jane, that you must allow. Her aunt, Mrs. Reed is a horrible, evil woman. She is unjust to Jane. She treats her like less than a servant, allows her children to bully her, locks her in her, the room where her husband died. Are you shouting, Charlotte? No. Now, here, you wrote, the passions may rage furiously like true heathens as they are, and the desires may imagine all sorts of vain things, but judgment shall still have the last word in every argument. Your Mr. Rochester says that about Jane Eyre. That passage should prove to you that I am not so wild and passionate a creature as you seem to think me, surely. Hardly. Jane Eyre does control herself admirably, but how would you know so much about the passions that rage if you did not know them intimately yourself? And if I do, or did, how is that a fault? God made me to have feelings, and they are my own. Yes, and you show the knowledge that we are to control ourselves in your portrayal of Jane Eyre. But did you control yourself? Did you break any of the Ten Commandments? I dare say I did. Did not you? Does not everyone at one time or other? I thought repentance was the key to forgiveness. It is, certainly. But have you repented in your heart of what your passions led you to do? That is for me to know. Are you going to examine some more of my texts to find out? No, I am going to examine your life. My life? Why, yes, it is of your life of which we speak. Are truth and fiction so mixed in your mind? Your writings are only part of the evidence. You have read Villette? Yes. I thought that was fiction. Yes, yes it is. Monsieur Paul Emmanuel is based on no one in real life? A little. He, you know how one draws one's characters partly based on the people around. Surely you have done so yourself. No, that I did not. My characters are not merely thinly veiled sketches of my friends. No, <laughs> that is why they are wood without heart or feeling. Had you ever loved, your characters might have been of flesh and blood. Is this passion again under whose influence you speak? No, it is anger. I think we are speaking of different kinds of passion, you and I. Anger you scarcely seem able to comprehend. But then what passion did you ever know? It is true, I was very seldom angry. I have, as I intimated, a happy temper and laughed myself out of bad feelings as quickly as I could. You laugh at everything. You would laugh at love itself. I hope not. I hope I never laughed at what is wise and good. But again, we are not met here to debate the merits of our styles of writing, nor yet our differences of nature. The subject is passion. And I would wish you, Charlotte, 
to be very open about the object of your passion. Much may depend upon it. There is no point in concealment. I invite you to be candid, to say what you ought. You know then, all about how I loved Monsieur Hege. That would be Monsieur Constantin Hege of Brussels, the teacher. You know it. A married man, I believe. You know that too. The married man to whom you wrote these words. Please, don't. But I must. It is perhaps, unfortunately, my duty and my fate. I did not choose it, you know, Charlotte. Go on, then. You wrote, Monsieur, the poor have not need of much to sustain them. They ask only for the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. But if they are refused the crumbs, they die of hunger. Nor do I either need much affection from those I love. You wrote that? Yes, I did. And there's nothing wrong with those words. A person will die without love. I didn't. You are not human. Really, Charlotte, think what you are saying and collect yourself. I must go on. You wrote, I should not know what to do with a friendship entire and complete. I'm not used to it, but you showed me of your a little interest when I was your pupil in Brussels, and I hold on to the maintenance of that little interest. I hold on to it as I would hold on to life. You are blushing. You regret these passionate words? They are regrettable, written as they are to a married man. No, no, I do not regret. I never will regret. Loving my master, Monsieur Hege, was as much a part of me as the world all around. The air that I breathed and the water I drank, it was part of my soul. You no longer breathe the air or drink the water, and you are soon to meet another master. You are not, then, my mistress? Certainly not. Only a mistress of prose, who writes like an angel, if you will. <laughs> I don't believe anybody would ever say that about me. Now, now, do not deprecate yourself so much. You do not write like an angel, certainly, but you do write like a woman. You say this? Indeed I do. Your passions are a part of you, and they give your books, Jane Eyre, the professor, all of them indeed, their intensity, their strength. I believe that is true. You, you like them then? I thought you did not. Well, no, I can't say that I do. You wrote at a later period than I, and I dislike romanticism and twaddle. Oh. I tried what I could do to destroy the Gothic by laughter in Northanger Abbey, but you took it up again 50 years later as if I had never written. I do not believe it spoiled my work. You are no judge. Yet I see a certain talent in you, raw, natural, unrefined. You have a great capacity to engage your reader and in truth. If you attain a place in heaven, your works will rank high for eternity, very high. Only a little below mine, in fact. And above those, I think of George Eliot. Your characters are, as you yourself aver, more alive. Your story is more appealing to more people. There is something arid about Eliot, which is strangely at variance with the sinful life that she... <laughs> I thought we were to speak only of me. Bless me. <laughs> so we are. Well, let us finish our business then. I am rather in haste. Before I can begin to write another divine work of my own, I am called to judge Dorothy Wordsworth. <laughs> you came up at about the same time, but I took you by alphabet rule. You seem to me the more interesting I really don't want to hear about her feelings for her brother. But you wanted to hear about my feelings for the man I loved. Yes, 
You must have loved him very much to create such strong and passionate gentlemen. Not only Paul Emmanuel, but Mr. Rochester. As a matter of fact, he reminds me a little of my own Mr. Darcy. Your Mr. Darcy? Yes. Do you know, Jane, I, I believe I may have judged you too harshly. I don't really think anyone could have written Mr. Darcy who had never loved. Thank you for that, Charlotte. And you are very right. I did not copy my characters from life, but their nature, their behavior was very closely observed by me in other contexts. And as you have confessed so much, I will confide that I did love someone once, a man who... And who, who was he? Ah, uh, let that be my secret. Is he here? Not yet, but then I don't need him any more here. That is fortunate. It is best as it is. But now, as to our business. Our business? Oh, yes. I had quite forgotten, Monsieur Hergé. Yes, well then, you told him you loved him, I know, and his wife was very angry. She was. She threw you out of the house, I believe? She did. But you did not succeed in seducing Monsieur Hergé? Your, your friendship was not irregular? <laughs> no, of course it wasn't. We never misbehaved. I mean, I suppose I threw myself at his head, but nothing happened. Nothing? No. I told him I loved him. <laughs> that was only the truth. But he would hardly even speak to me after that. And very soon afterward, I was made to leave. I crawled like a worm out of there. But we never touched one another. <laughs> we never even kissed. If he had made you the extraordinary proposition that Mr. Rochester made to Jane Eyre when she found out he had a mad wife living, would you have done as Jane Eyre did? Would you have refused him? Refused? Yes. If Monsieur J had wanted to make you his mistress while he had a wife still living, would you have refused? Would you have controlled your passions and obeyed the rule of what was right and rational as Jane Eyre did? Yes, I would. I was never called upon to make any such difficult decision, but I could never have been his mistress. And why not? Because of the laws of God or of man? Both, but also because of my own self-respect. Perhaps to be truthful, that most of all. If he had loved me, he would not have asked me to commit that crime, to live as a tainted woman, an outcast. His asking me to do such a thing would have killed my love for him. And because he did not ask you, you still love him. Part of me always shall. But a second attachment, a second love, is the best cure, as I believe you have found. You were happy in your marriage. I was, yes. Very happy. I learned what love and marriage really are. It was very sad to have to leave my husband so soon. Never mind. You will see him again. Will I? Yes. Not for quite a long time, however. I am afraid he does not ascend until 1906. He has half a century left of fending off curiosity seekers. Poor man. Arthur, poor dear Arthur. But if, if I am going to see him, if we will be together for an eternity, that, that means... Yes, Charlotte Bronte. You have taken your place at the seat of judgment, and I pronounce that you have been passed. You may ascend into heaven and take your seat. Whether you may rise higher yet to become a superior angel is yet to be determined by higher powers than myself. 
but you are safe from me, safe from any warmer fate. You may sing with the angels and with the most elevated celestial authors. The shining ones welcome you to their midst. Thank you. You do not have me to thank. You have the rectitude of your own principles. Will you shake hands? Of course I will. Welcome to heaven. May I present to you as a gift on this happy occasion, the first book I completed after my arrival here. It is called Sanditon. I began it when in ill health, but the second part is much better written and the ending is quite happy. A niece of mine tried to finish it down below, but it was nonsense. I have written between 20 and 30, no, almost 40 more books since I died, you know, all novels. Good heavens. Yes, it is a very productive place and we authors have all the time in the world. Now, have you any questions before I leave you? Well, I only wonder. I know you have access to everything that's ever been written, but how did you come to know so much about my life, really? About Monsieur Heger and my husband? Are you all seeing? Oh, dear no, not I. You give me far more credit than what can be. No, I read all about it. Your friend, you know, Mrs. Gaskell, wrote quite a good and intimate biography of you. Oh, no, she didn't. She couldn't. Oh, that woman, that horrible, meddling, presumptuous, busybody, interfering. Now, with... now, Charlotte, don't be passionate. Remember now, think only of the past as its remembrance gives you pleasure. And Mrs. Gaskell kept your secret about Monsieur Eger after a fashion. There was not much else she did not tell the public, however. She did not. Dare she? Tell me she didn't disturb Arthur and my poor father. Oh, oh, it's unspeakable. Mrs. Gaskell. Charlotte, pray calm yourself. Whatever you may think of her actions, she will be here one day and you can take it up with her then. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I have a much happier thought for you. What's that? Why, your sisters are here. Did you not know? Their predeceasing you was sadness indeed, but now you will reap the benefit of it, for they are waiting in the next room to greet you. All of them, your dear mother too, and your two sisters who died of typhoid in that wretched boarding school. Something like that once nearly happened to me too as a child, and I can sympathize. And of course, Anne, and Emily? Not Branwell. What do you think? Oh, Jane, to see, I will really see my darling mother and my dear, dear sisters. I thought you would be happy. I am, I am. Oh, oh. Please, won't you come to be introduced? Emily and Anna writers too. I should dearly like you to know them. No, no, certainly not. <laughs> go on, Charlotte, go. They're over there. Can you see the shining in that corner? Go. Oh, mother, oh, Anne and Emily, oh, oh. oh. Meet Emily Bronte, God. Good God, no, as if I had not been avoiding an encounter with that wild creature these last seven years. I'd as soon meet Madame de Stahl. Not that it is likely I shall ever be forced into the acquaintance now, but what a fate, what a fate. Fortunately, heaven is wide enough for us all. All right. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, I want like to create like a standing ovation yeah. by just adding comments. Uh, 
clapping of hands, just really great job. I really I thought that was a phenomenal performance. And I hope people in the comments will, will share uh, their admiration for that wonderful play. Um, we're going to start the Q&A section now. Um, and I wanted to kick things off by asking you, Diana, just how much fun you had writing the script to this play and performing it. Uh, Siri, you too, how much fun did you both have performing this play? More words than there are in the language. <laughs> we had so much fun in every aspect of it. It's just total serendipity and joy. You know, from the writing of it, I it had that phenomenon where I was laughing as I wrote. <laughs> and the performing it, um, well, we performed this play oh, a bunch of times in various- this is the fifth time. Yeah, yeah. and uh, mostly up and down Seattle and uh, the West Coast. And England, of course, which was the peak of all magical moments. <sighs> yeah, it's always fun. <laughs> what a treat it is for me to speak Diana's words and to be mm -hmm. such a haughty Jane, so impressed with herself. <laughs> I mean, uh, that is a treat for anyone. And mm -hmm. I have so much fun doing it. I would love to do it again right now. Well, we just did. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it was it's interesting how it came about when I thought, see, I'd written a couple of plays about Mrs. Elton. I like all the Jane Austen villains from, from Emma. And so I'd, I put those on at Jasna meetings, you know, a few times. And then I had the idea of writing a, a play about um, a, a dialogue between Jane Austen and another great literary character. I originally thought of Lord Byron, but he was too, it just couldn't make it happen. It was no way, not even in heaven. And I couldn't picture anything in heaven. <laughs> So then I thought of Charlotte Bronte, who is another great love and lifelong, you know, favorite of mine. And I thought that would work, but I knew I could never play Jane Austen. I just couldn't. It seemed like opposite of typecasting, <laughs> you know, you know, elderly New York Jewish lady. I don't think so. I mean, actors, actresses, actresses are supposed to be able to portray any part, but I'm not an actress. You know, I wrote my first play when I was in my 60s. And although I can read my words because I wrote them and I, I feel them, uh, but I could not be Jane Austen. And I fought around my circle of acquaintance in the Jane Austen world, and, you know, Jasmine meetings and so on, uh, about who might play my Jane Austen as I conceived her. And I immediately thought of Siri, who, you know, she had, she was just right the way I imagined it. You know, she's composed and serene and, uh, confident of her powers and yet funny. <laughs> it's just a unique, it was just perfect. So I asked her, and um, how did you feel when you were asked, Siri? <laughs> I was so thrilled. Yeah, she wanted to do it. I, the minute I read it, I was just over the moon because I think at that time I had just written my first book about Jane Austen and my book about Charlotte Bronte. And I perfect. had spent so much time researching both of them and to do to be in a play about both of them. Yeah, and that was the thing too, it started everything. Because after this play, I mean, I had many, we both have many friends in the Jane Austen world and, and out of it, who love and adore to read Jane Austen and have all their lives, and Charlotte Bronte too. But there's not that many people who have devoted their writing and inner lives to them for decades as we have, and we live in the same city. So, it, and after that, we wrote all those Jane Austen plays for, for Jasna meetings. Um, we've done the Austen Assizes in which all the Jane Austen villains are put on trial. We did these jointly. Um, we did one of backstage in Mansfield Park, uh, the play within the play. Mm -hmm. and, um, Lucy, who, uh, what did Lucy steal from Sense and Sensibility? And, uh, <laughs> it's always been great fun and we write together uh, as if we were in heaven already. It's a dream partnership. Right? Really, really fun to write yeah, together. I, I mean, you would think we'd be a couple of divas and be tearing each other's hair out, but we've never had a crossword. We're, we're both kind of professionals. I mean, we both worked in the movie business for a long time and um, you know, series written screenplays. And I you know, worked at Warner Brothers as a story analyst for so long. And so when one of us would say, that sentence isn't quite right. The other would say, well, we can fix it like this. Yes, that's good. It just works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Given us both complete professional joy, I think I can safely say. Mm. That's great. 
And so I, I'm curious, building off of that, because you were talking about performing together and working together, I'm curious how your various performances of the play have maybe changed your thoughts about it, changed your thoughts about, um, you know, these authors, or perhaps even led you to revise the play even. I haven't revised a word. Nothing. nothing. No, no. When, um, when we were first looking at it before our first performance, <clears throat> we looked at it, came up with some things to fix about it. And then Diana did a revision at that time. I haven't touched it since. Not since. Let's do it the same. And every time we do it, in the past, of course, we've been on a stage and we moved around. You were able to see my beautiful white gown. That she made herself. Right. <laughs> Covered in little white flowers and lace. It's just lovely. Sorry, you can't see it. But I did put up a nice lace backdrop to um, give an impression of heaven here for us. Mm. But, We're in her house, and, and the, the, the camera is seated on top of four dictionaries. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought, well, if we're going to not be able to move around on stage and do it, because this is, you know, like a Zoom performance, and we're going to be really right next to each other, that was the only thing that had a slightly different, um, mm -hmm. there's no blocking, but it was a slightly different kind of performance since we're sitting together. Um, it's... I think a different experience when you see it on stage, but maybe this is better. It's up close and personal. It's, yeah, it's different. But we've, we've always, you know, had people enjoying it. The best, the best time, as I say, was at Chotten House Library, when mm -hmm. a curator from the Morgan Library in New York was there, and she came up to us all excited afterwards, and she said she just loved it, and, and she said most talking head plays, two people plays don't really work. But she said, this mm -hmm. one did. It was very mm -hmm. clever. And you both did it so well. We'd like to put it on at the Morgan Library. And for various reasons, it never happened. But that was one of the sweet moments of my life to know that my little amdram, amateur dramatic play, was considered of a caliber to be at the Morgan Library. I mean, my goodness. I was ex as excited and pleased as if it, as if it really had going on to reproduce there. Just try to imagine the excitement of playing yeah. Jane Austen in Chotten House Library. That was with, something. <laughs> in Diana's wonderful play. With all Janeites and scholars and people who they knew as much they knew as much or more than It was actually did. a Charlotte Bronte bicentennial conference, as yeah. I recall. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well we should comment all the wonderful comments from people in the audience and many of them quoting your exact lines of how um, uh, Charlotte has no sense of humor and has these little fits of pride and <laughs> just your, the comments from your script um, are terrific. But here's a, here's a question. Um, well, I have my own question first. Mm -hmm. I've always thought that, um, the connection between Jane Eyre, which I will confess now publicly, is actually my favorite book, even though I am a Jane Austen person. <laughs> so now the whole world knows, okay? But um, the connection between Jane Eyre and Mansfield Park. And I've always thought that as much as Bronte was so negative about Austen, and yet I think she picks a lot when she writes Jane Eyre directly from Mansfield Park, especially the beginning, their childhood. So I don't know if you've thought about that or that's a new idea, but I'm just throwing that out there. And then I'll read more happy comments here. I did think about it years ago, um, probably around the time I was writing this. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't, I can't really address it now, but it's, there certainly are common actions there. Well, I I personally don't think there was any correlation whatsoever. I researched <laughs> Charlotte Bronte's life in depth for two years to write yeah. a novel about her, The Secret Diaries of Charlotte Bronte. And the reason she wrote the part about the childhood in the beginning was because of her experience mm -hmm. at that horrible school uh, where her two sisters died. And she was pouring mm -hmm. out her experience on the page, and it's, I'm sure it was a kind of therapy. Yeah. Um, and she and her brothers and sisters wrote all these 
wonderful little stories growing up and they imagined all these worlds and she had a hero, um, the Duke of Zamorna who like precedes Mr. Rochester and combining the Duke of Zamorna with, um, you know, Monsieur Hergé, who she fell in love with, that's how she came up with all of her heroes. And I think it was a completely, utterly original work mm -hmm. and had nothing to do whatsoever with Mansfield Park. I can't remember if she'd read Mansfield Park. Well, according to your script, she didn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That must be the product of some old research. <laughs> and I just wanted to say one thing before, so I don't lose a chance to say this. We didn't get to talk in the beginning before the play began. And I wanted to say what an honor it is for both of us to be here yeah. tonight, mm -hmm. that you invited us to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, to um, yeah. to everyone who is watching, it was um, a thrill and an honor to perform this. And I'm just, I know Diane and I speak for both of us. We're both so grateful to be here. Tonight. We are. Thank you. you know, in the, the five or six performances we've given, we may have reached maybe a few hundred people have seen it all together. Mm -hmm. But at this moment, now, it's <laughs> tripled, right. quadrupled. So it's, it's a, it's a yeah. dream, and it's going to stay up on your website. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's a dream for a writer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're cognizant of our honor, yes. That's great. Well, thank you for that. And we're, we're really just happy to connect fans of Jane Austen and the Brontes from around the world through these events. Um, and Speaking of that, if you're in the audience and you have a question, please keep uh, commenting and adding your questions to the chat. You can also uh, email questions to us. Um, and I am looking for the email address and I'll try to find that in a second. But I wanted to ask a question that came in to our email um, mm -hmm. during your presentation. It's from Christina Moreland and it's kind of long, so I'm going to read it um, in chunks. So here's a question for uh, for you all. Um, thanks so much to Diana and Siri for their wonderful writing and their performances tonight. At one point during the play, Jane Austen notes that she has her Janeites, but Charlotte Bronte will not have the same kind of following. Why do you think that's the case? What is it about Austen that has gained such a large popular following while Bronte, though she has devoted supporters, myself included, doesn't quite capture the popular imagination in the same way. Well, in the first place, Jane Austen hadn't happened yet, not for Charlotte, but Charlotte does have a huge society and lots of followers too. Maybe mm -hmm. the answer is that Jane Austen is now having this massive popularity for one word only, movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, we do true. have a million um, adaptations of Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre, it's so true. <laughs> we do have movies, just not the rest of her books. Um, <laughs> but the moment is, is cinematically is right now Jane. I think yeah. one thing about Jane Austen is that light, bright, and sparkling is a good description of most of what she writes, and especially the way it translates to the screen. We have, you know, beautiful and handsome actors and actresses and um, stories that are romantic and uh, it's like a fairy tale world that you just want to dive into and live in. Whereas mm -hmm. the Brontes, all of them, they wrote these dark, brooding stories and there's um, a, um, a different tone to the whole thing. And I think Jane is just more fun and so much more comedy. In, mm -hmm in a Jane Austen novel and film. So I think that's why she's more popular. Mm -hmm. So I talked a, a little bit at the beginning about some of the themes that we're hoping to carry throughout the series. And one of them is finding commonality while also celebrating difference. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious what you think about after Jane and Charlotte have had this exchange, how, how do they view each other? after this? Do they see links between each other that they didn't before? Or what kind of do you think Charlotte's opinion has evolved? I'd love to hear you talk about how this might have impacted them. Well, they see everything. It's in heaven. And it's not given to us to know. <laughs> Can't possibly. Can't go there. Maybe we'll have a sequel. Hmm. What do you think? Charlotte and Jane having tea in heaven a couple years later. Well, they could, they could also in you know, interview a few other writers 
and, mm. and judge of them. That could be a sequence of play. Well, Gaskell's coming there soon enough, right? <laughs> that would be a cat fight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that that's a good idea. I think Jane should moderate, and then we should have the two women just, you know, have a sure face-up. I'm not sure if Gaskell is famous enough. <laughs> for it to you know to be appeal to a well, I don't know audience. North and South is a really yeah, South. South. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's a question Diana what inspired you to use the entrance exam to heaven approach mm -hmm. as the way to compare the two bios and careers it's a good question yeah well, um, when I gave up the idea that I could have her have a dialogue with any literary figure in, in her real life, I mean, you know, she and Byron were lived in, this, were in the same city at times, but he left England in 1816 and she died in 1817. There's just, and maybe they could have met once at her, their publisher, their mutual publisher's office, but it was that tangential. And hmm. so I, I knew it had to be in heaven. And... Uh, when I thought of it being Charlotte and Jane, well, they, they didn't overlap either. Uh, mm -hmm. Jane, uh, Charlotte was born the year before Jane died. So uh, then I thought Jane went to heaven first and she was superior because in my view, she is the greatest woman writer of all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Jane Austen. Oh, I mean, thank you. <laughs> And so I then I thought, she, what if she was, it just came to my head, what, what if she was literary arbiter? That would be funny. And, and mm -hmm. when I started putting, putting them talking about it together, this was one of those things that just wrote itself. They just talked. It just took me a few days to get it down on paper. Great. She's a genius. No, She's it doesn't genius. happen, you know, very often, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes when Car Jane Austen's characters, she invented that way of speaking and everything. And, and when they start to talk, you know, just you just have to take your your feathered pen and write it down. That's interesting that you were able to kind of develop the script fairly quickly. And one of my favorite parts of the script itself is the way that you weave in letters that Bronte wrote referencing Austin. And I um, love this comment we got from a, a viewer in the audience. Um, the panic in Jane's face when Charlotte said that she could see yeah. her letters too. Um, I loved that part of the play. There was such humor in that. But the yeah. role of letters and letter writing and how even as like modern uh, readers of Jane Austen and, and Charlotte Bronte, like we use their personal letters to help us to understand their works better. Could you talk a little bit more about like what went into maybe if there was like a research side to writing this script? Well, the research was, if it's all about the letters, you mm -hmm. know, I had to read the letters to know what uh, uh, Jane, uh, Charlotte sure. Bronte's feelings about Jane Austen were. Fortunately, they existed. She had quite mm -hmm. a lot to say, enough to write a play about. Mm -hmm. uh, just weave them in, as you say. And it makes me very sad that we lost so many of Jane Austen's letters. Uh, like, we wish there were more. We could have even we more of a Yeah. Mm hmm mm hmm but that was the that was the research really. They existed. That's mm -hmm. why I gave up the Bronte, the uh, the Byron idea, because uh, mm -hmm. he just vaguely knew she existed. I know there's a letter exists that John Murray, the publisher, wrote to him saying how sad it was about the death of that the, the young writer Jane Austen. He didn't even answer it or, or comment mm -hmm. on it in his reply. It didn't mean anything to him. I know his his horrible wife, you know, that he hated so much. She she had Jane Austen books in her her library. They weren't exactly in communication. I mean, we, I traced down everything between them. There was nothing, but there was something tangible. Mm. And Jane wrote so many saucy things most to her sister Cassandra that's mm. made it, you know, past the, you know, the test where she destroyed oh. what thousands of letters. Don't you wonder what was in all of the ones that she burned? Oh my goodness! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We know the nasty ones she wrote, the, the funny ones that were unkind and, and critical of people that she knew. But she saved those. That they, three or four of them exist still, but I think there must be a lot more than <laughs> Cassandra Byrne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there were enough to to see 
it, it really helped to judge their differences. I love the character of Jane in this play because, as I said, mm -hmm. her sense of confidence in herself and mm -hmm. pride in her work and just, um, I believe that Jane Austen felt that way about herself. She was uh, always right. She really was. Yeah. People write books about what would, you know, my conduct guide from Jane Austen or how to live yeah, life. Right. <laughs> she, she stood in certitude. I've, I've often had people ask me, what do you think Jane would think mm -hmm. if she looked down from heaven and mm -hmm. see, you know, all of the stuff going on about her and how people adore her today. And mm -hmm. um, I think she would be honored and amazed mm -hmm. and humbled and amused. Mm -hmm. I think she would be amazed to be on the 10 pound note and she'd wish that she could collect her royalties. I think that's yes. <laughs> cuter, you know, internet cuter. <laughs> yeah. But that's why I, I, I saw you as, as the persona. You could project that. How lucky am I? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here's a question. Have the Morgan folks approached you for a performance for next year? They are going to have a major exhibit yeah. next summer. I should probably um, get in touch with them. You it's going to be called uh, Jane Austen, an Imaginist like herself, June through September. You should. Okay. Yeah. Excellent yeah. suggestion. Get on yeah. it. Do it. <laughs> I, that would be my dearest dream for sure. Um, at the time, it, I probably didn't follow it up hard enough and by the time I got in touch and said, are we going to do this thing? Uh, they'd hired, they'd gotten a professor to give a talk instead. So it just kind of blew it, you know, yeah. but you can't do that. <laughs> you have to follow up. Follow up. Yeah. Definitely. They'd love it. Thank you for the suggestion. So going back to the, the comment in the play about, um, Charlotte Bronte not having her Janeites that Eric asked about. A couple suggestions from the audience I wanted to quickly share. Could Charlotte's fans be the Brontettes? <laughs> Brontettes? Sounds, <good>. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good possibility. Um, or uh, Laura Rockland, one of our uh, feature speakers in the series, has suggested that they might be referred to as airheads, which oh, is yes. great. <laughs> So thank you, Laura. It's a terrible pun. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to ask about. So I there are a couple moments in the play where it was kind of implied that if Charlotte Bronte had read Persuasion, that it might have changed her view of Austin. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious if you could comment more about that um, mm -hmm. and, and that line of thinking. Well, that's mostly modern people now think of Persuasion as her most emotional Mm -hmm. uh, romantic piece. Mm -hmm. uh, they say that the, the final letter that Wentworth writes to Anne is the most you know, passionate, emotional, best of its kind. I mean, people go nuts about that. They, they really, really, really love it. You know, the, nobody, I really think, could think that she wasn't passionate and didn't mm -hmm. know and feel love and read, read that. I think that's the general impression. Mm -hmm. Or actually, I, I think that Pride and Prejudice is as romantic as anybody needs. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love this comment from the audience, uh, from an audience participant. Uh, this is kind of coming from the end of your, your play. OMG, Jane Austen finished Sanditon and Anne wrote 40 more books in heaven. I love that like kind of uh, possibility. Like what if we had more of Austen's novels? What if... Yeah, it's got to be the way it is. Well, you know, I did write the missing manuscript of Jane Austen, which is available mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. books are sold. Mm -hmm. um, and it's imagining <laughs> what if Jane did write a seventh novel and mm -hmm. what if it went missing? And it's it's a dual timeline story with a scholar who finds it and then we get to read the entire book. We should all go out and purchase a copy purchase. of that. It's a, it's a great book, actually. I will attest to that. So. You know, I'm not on that theme about writing more in heaven. Mm -hmm. you know, I guess I shouldn't inject a personal, not funny note. But my husband, who was a poet, passed away last year. And I've often thought that he's, mm -hmm. you know, having all the fun in the world, talking to Keats and Shelley and Shakespeare and all those guys. And mm -hmm. 
and doing nothing but writing, playing with cats and having a lovely time. Oh, so what a wonderful <laughs> thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, uh, a woman here wrote, the Bronte characters need some serious meds and therapy. <laughs> Lots of therapy. And also, Austin, they're funny. Jane Eyre and Mr. Rochester are not in the least amusing. So mm -hmm. what would you say about that? I think we tried to play it that way. Mm -hmm. you know, we made Jane witty and uh, Charlotte isn't being witty at all. She takes everything very much to heart. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the Brontes are very serious. Mm -hmm. um, if someone can find a funny moment in a Bronte book, I would now love to hear about it. it. Now that you mentioned it. Love to hear about it. So I think, you know, that affects their popularity level. And yet, Deb, Jane Eyre is one of my favorite books on earth. I've read it 197 <laughs> times and it's like a tie with Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion. They're yeah. Also, these are the contrasts, big contrasts in their characters and their personas and their lives that makes it work that they talk to each other. Yeah. They're so different. Yeah. So there's a, a comment from Lori Davis that I think relates to our letters discussion that's quite interesting. This week I was thinking about Emily Dickinson asking Lavinia to burn her letters, and I realized it did not so much protect Emily, whose letters were sent to others, but protecting privacy of those writing to her. Um, mm. And so that that's an interesting comment I thought I would highlight. Mm. Hello, um, Lori. <laughs> Well, you know, Charlotte's letters were preserved, uh, 500 of them that, that she wrote to her friend Ellen Nussie, who was nicknamed Nell. And um, when Charlotte married, her husband, Arthur Bell Nichols, insisted that um, Ellen burn every one of them because he said those should not be ever made available to anyone. So instead, Ellen kept them and sold them and then they became published. And Maybe Charlotte would have been horrified by that, and maybe her husband was, but aren't we lucky? Because mm -hmm. when you read Charlotte's letters, I mean, I read every single one of them, just as I read all of Jane's, and that is how I was able to write novels and become them and put myself in their mind was reading through their letters. And be it said that a deep lifelong study of Jane Austen well, can't make you her because nobody can be and you're delusional if you think you can be, but it makes you a much better writer. She is the best mm -hmm. writing teacher and the best writing school uh, that we have ever had. And we, you know, I myself have read Jane, all Jane Austen's books, not hundreds of times, but probably thousands to study her sentence structure and the balance of her sentences and how she, how she makes jokes that you keep finding even on the hundredth reread. Mm -hmm. You keep really, you got it. It just makes you better, even if you, you know, not get very good. I, I would add to that her plots and her character mm -hmm. arcs. So I'm very, very much into character development and story structure, and that is the gift that keeps on giving from Jane Austen. Look at how much fan fiction we have, and how, like Shakespeare, her stories are continually updated to different countries and different time periods, and they work no matter where you are no matter what culture they're set in, it's because she understood human nature so well and understood what a great story is. So you combine that with her writing style and pure brilliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have learned, both of us, a huge amount, everything, from the study of her, her writing. Um, it's, it's, it's a school. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. We have kind of along those lines a comment from Victoria that both your script and performance gave us such a beautiful balance between the two writers. And I loved it, like the kind of the sequence in the play is that you the play begins with the dichotomy being that each writer has a different temper, uh, a different view on passions, but that by the end of the play, they find respect for each other They because they recognize that they each find solace in their own writing. And I'm wondering if you could speak more to like what you are, are ultimately hoping to demonstrate by putting these two writers in conversation in that way, by starting out as writers trashing writers, mm -hmm. but then ultimately landing in a very different place by the by the end. 
yeah, that you, you've got exactly, you're speaking exactly of what it was I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Okay. Cool. They are so different and mm -hmm. somehow they couldn't in life. They didn't have the opportunity in life. And, mm -hmm. but, uh, I think they would if they had ever had an opportunity to get to really know each other. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why you're so doing what you're doing. <laughs> now you need to do one with Gaskell. That's right. Gaskell's gotten a lot of plugs here. Comment, okay. <laughs> it does seem like a that maybe she that could that could have happened in, in this play. She she seemed to be just waiting in the wings to come out. And mm -hmm. have that with yeah. I think we maybe have time for, for one more question um, and then we'll kind of wrap up the Q&A. Uh, if you have any last minute questions, please, please feel free to comment. But David or Deb, do either of you have any remaining questions that you want to share? Well, here's one good, the last question right here. Do you see that one? We don't do see want questions. Or not no, see. I'm saying David, do you oh. see that? Um, you can read it, Deb. That's fine. Okay. Well, now I've lost it. Um, where'd it go? It's one, it says Jane Austen summer program on it. I oh see yeah, it. here it is. It's from Catherine. Great play. Mm -hmm. Do you think Charlotte Bronte thought Jane's writing was not passionate based on Darcy's awful proposal? <laughs> <laughs> um, after all, Edward Rochester's declaration was so profound mm -hmm. and talked of a cord of communication being lost with Jane Eyre, which well, is- that, that particular proposal didn't actually enter my mind, I don't think, but we do know that the Wentworth letter was as passionate as you could possibly oh, want. Passionate as there is. Yeah, yeah. but Darcy, yeah, I, I, I hadn't, I mean, I do say in the play that, um, that nobody could have written Darcy who didn't love. Right. Because so many people love him now, that's for sure. <laughs> but he's a bit problematic. He is. Yeah. Not like Wentworth, though. <laughs> well, everybody's got their own, and we could be here for another hour talking about who is your favorite Jane Austen hero. It's um, true. Well, mine is Henry Tilney. Well, yeah. I think mine too. I'll just throw in my opinion. Uh, the, uh, are you I, Jane or are you Siri? Um, I'll, be, I'll be Siri first. Um, <laughs> I think that um, Charlotte, when she said all those things about Jane's writing, that she was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that Jane's writing is extremely passionate and incre incredibly deeply felt. Yep. And I think that maybe it was Charlotte's problem mm -hmm. that she didn't see passion because she felt that the only way you could see or experience passion was to have it all over the page. It just had to yeah. be this huge, incredible explosion of emotion. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. And that is perhaps what she and Emily put into their books. And that is not the way Charlotte, or that's not the way Jane wrote. And yet Jane's books are full of passion. So um, I just want to yeah. smack Charlotte because she was wrong. <laughs> she was wrong. And in the 19th century, opinions of both of those authors were different than they are today. You know, mm -hmm. we have the long view um, and we can see both their greatness. So mm -hmm. Jane had... Um, perfectly good reason to have a chip on her shoulder about what Charlotte wrote about her. Mm -hmm. And um, I approve of this message. <laughs> <laughs> so were there any other questions, Eric? Was there anything? No? no I think we're ready to wrap up. Okay. So well, I want to thank you for having us. Thank again. you so much for having thank us. Thank you. <laughs> That's well, funny. we want to thank you for joining us and what a great way to start. Pleasure. Well, it's just such a great way to start this series of Austin and Bronte. Um, so we're just going to share a few, a little bit of news about the Jane Austen and co. And uh, Eric is going to do that next. Absolutely. So thank yeah. you all for joining us. Yeah. And thank you, Siri and Diana one more time. And if you're wanting to add another comment, um, Thanking them, please, please do that now as we wind down. Um, our, our next event will take place on April 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern, where we'll get to hear from Leslie Peterson. Uh, and this will be a creative writing workshop on the art of the rant and, um, and the, or the rave, I should say. And um, 
stay tuned uh, for, for, for future news and more information on that upcoming event. And please subscribe to uh, our newsletter and our website if you haven't already. Um, we know that not everyone can afford uh, to support and donate to this program, which is why we are trying to keep it free. Um, if you can and, and are willing to donate, uh, please consider donating at the link on the screen. Uh, and you can also don donate anytime you register for events. It makes a big difference uh, for us. We've been particularly proud to maintain a, a pay what you can format. So when you go to register, um, you can pay a, a small uh, amount if you choose, but you can also choose to not pay. Um, if you are able, again, please consider supporting our programming. Uh, and we want to keep Jane Austen and Company as widely available as possible for listeners across the world. Um, so even a few dollars can help make a big difference. So thank you for your continued support. Yeah. And just a reminder that the recording of tonight's presentation will be posted on our website, www.janeaustinandco.org, very soon. Uh, and so you can watch it again and again. Or if you are unable to join us live tonight, you can watch it later. Um, and if you can't wait until April 2nd for our next event, you can view any of our previous programs on our website as well. Um, there are topics ranging from bookbinding in the age of Austin to questionable home remedies from the Regency, which is fascinating. You should absolutely watch that one. Um, and appropriate for today, the unexpected connections between Austin and Byron. Um, so please enjoy. Um, we, we love bringing you these programs and we hope that you will enjoy them. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. All right. Thank you.